Welcome to Understanding Inequ or Inequity, Advancing Equity, the symposium. My name is Dr. Laura Harjo. I'm an associate professor in Native American Studies, and I will moderate today's symposium. Today, uh, this is a two-day symposium that's inspired by the internal seed grants on inequities that were organized earlier this year by the Office of the Vice President for Research and Partnerships. This symposium is, is co-sponsored by the Office of the Vice President for Research and Partnerships, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Arts and Humanities Forum, and the Early Childhood Education Institute, ECEIOU Tulsa. Today we'll have four or three parts to this symposium. The first are four presenters, four teams, and we will have a brief Q&A for about five minutes at the end of each one. Um, as we get um, to the five minute mark at the end during the q and I'll kind of raise my finger so that we can continue on so we can make sure that we're on time. Uh, the second part is our keynote and the third is a round table discussion. So we have presenters from four different research teams that are going to present their initial work today from these seed grants. And I invite you, the audience, to write your questions in the Q&A box of the webinar during each presentation so that we can pick up those questions very briefly at the end of each one. So we will begin with our first team. And the first team consists of Sherry Castle, Diane Horm, Xion Young Jion and Liz Frechette. They're with the Early Childhood Education Institute of OU Tulsa. And their presentation is entitled, Inequities Start Early, Secondary Analysis to Investigate Associations Among Neighborhood Factors and the Development of Executive Function in Young Children. So we will begin with that. drive around your city, um, you know that there are different neighborhoods and you know that there are different resources and opportunities available in those neighborhoods. So just think of your average middle class or upper class neighborhood. Generally there are attractive parks and well outfitted playgrounds and grocery stores with healthy fresh food and bookstores and libraries. So there are ample resources to support healthy child development um, in that type of a neighborhood. But if you go to a low income neighborhood, those same resources are not available. And of course, the neighborhood supports the child and the family and offers experiences and opportunities. So we would expect different outcomes um, from children growing up in those two very different experiences. We are interested in understanding the variables that cause these disparities so early in a child's life. And to date, research has investigated variables within the child, variables within the child's family, and variables within the preschool environment that the child, that the child may attend. But we haven't yet looked at neighborhoods extensively in the field of early childhood research. The Early Childhood Education Institute serves as the local program evaluation partner for two early childhood education uh, programs here in Tulsa, CAP Tulsa and Educare. So we have ongoing data collection that happens in each of those programs that is shaped by their program goals as well as some partnerships that they have as well. We over time have been building accumulating data sets about hundreds of children who go through those programs and um, have been gathering that data and we analyze it each year to provide them feedback to their programs. Um, using the two data sets together allows us to increase the number of children in our sample size, which lets us um, have additional statistical power to be able to detect effects. The biggest challenge is having common measures across both, um, both studies. Um, overall, each each program partner is really kind of in the driver's seat. They're the ones that are letting us know what their priorities are and helping um, guide the selection of measurements that we're using to assess children's ongoing development. Um, and so this was a chance where we really had an opportunity to um, pull from a common measure across both projects and um, be able to combine those data to explore these questions. 
Executive function is a set of higher order thinking skill involving domain general cognitive regulatory process. It includes inhibitory control, attention shifting, which is cognitive flexibility and working memory. Executive function predicts, pre predicts successful learning and performance in school at work in life. Research has found that uh, individual and family characteristics and school environment are associated with the development of young children's executive function. However, little research has been done on how digital environment such as neighborhood is associated with young children's cognitive development. This is an important topic to provide equitable opportunity to all children. So child development is a complex enterprise. Um, so children live in families, in neighborhoods, in cities, in society, and we have multiple influences on child development. If you stick within one discipline, you tend to use certain tools and methods and techniques and think about variables that are the tried and true in your field. But by partnering with another um, discipline, in our case for this project, the Urban Design Studio, um, they bring deep understanding of the neighborhoods of Tulsa and just what uh, resources are available in different neighborhoods. So it expands our thinking and, you know, theoretically we understand that neighborhoods are important to young children's development. But um, in the early childhood research field, we really haven't used the tools that our urban design colleagues bring to the table. So it expands our understanding, it adds a different perspective, and together we are able to do work that neither of our research groups would have done alone. We started with a process called geocoding. So ECEI uh, have surveyed kids and their parents at the Educares and the CAP Tulsa locations. Um, and so we had over 1,300 um, participants in that survey and they gave us our addresses. So we matched their addresses to addresses on our geographic information system uh, to see where they were located. Um, and as you can imagine, they're distributed all over the city of Tulsa and, and the nearby communities as well. Uh, they tend to be uh, clustered in poor areas of uh, town because uh, you have to uh, meet certain income requirements to be part of those programs. Um, and so uh, with the, those uh, participants located and all of their data located with them, uh, that sort of is like the first tier of analysis. And then we uh, want to um, uh, also analyze the, the neighborhoods that they live in. Uh, and to do that, um, you know, we're basically using census track uh, as, the, as the definition for that data. And we have uh, seven different types of census data that we're looking at uh, and uh, five different types of NANDA data. And, you know, uh, we are really particularly interested, at least from my perspective, in things like, you know, how does access to open space and parks, uh, you know, affect uh, it, the development of executive functioning kids, how about uh, access to uh, grocery stores, social services, um, how about uh, you know the, the walkability and transit um, aspects of their neighborhood. From the census tract you can tell yeah what the is it a food desert? Does that child have good access to health care? Um, does that child have good access to social organizations? Um, is there, you know, a lot of libraries, a lot of resources around that child um, for them to use? Um, and like theoretically, we're thinking that if there's more resources for that child to use in that specific census tract, and it's not a food desert, and there's less crime, um, or there's more resources for their development, um, then that will impact how they grow and they develop and how they do in school. We're using uh, M plus as our program that we're analyzing within and that allows us to cluster children um, like I was mentioning before within either classrooms um, or within neighborhoods um, and that takes into account 
the amount of variability in the outcome that's due to that child either being in that classroom or in that neighborhood, right? So if you think about variability, some of it is partitioned out into what's the effect of the teacher have what's the effect the teacher is having on that child's academic outcomes, or what's the effect that the neighborhood is having on that child's academic outcomes. Beyond that, you know, I think this will be an important step and we're really excited about the findings that will come from this study, um, but there will be a number of ways that we want to continue to build out this line of research. One um, is to definitely make sure that we extend beyond Tulsa. In smaller cities, in suburban areas, in rural areas, um, it will be an open question as to whether the neighborhood strengths that we identify through this project also function similarly for children growing up in different types of geographic areas. Another important way that we'll want to expand it is to consider additional aspects of the neighborhood or the geographic context that the child grows up in. So considering the green space that they have available to them or the, the food availability that is available to them. Um, all of these things, although it may be hard to conceptualize a direct alignment with academic or behavioral skills, um, there are some underlying um, pieces of evidence that would you know, lead us to suspect that um, the development of children is kind of holistically supported by their um, environment. ECI is looking for a federal level grant opportunities to expand this project. For example, Institute of Education Science, IES, provides research opportunity related to education policy and National Science Foundation, NSF, also provide various opportunity for research regarding social, behavioral, and economic science. Tulsa Educare has spent lots of time thinking about what we do inside of our classrooms and how we interact directly with our parents to help them reach their goals and also meet their emergency needs. But I really like that this study is helping us look outside those specific aspects to see the bigger picture and think more holistically about everything that's going on. Um, you know, children need really safe, nurturing, stable experiences. And so the extent to which they live in a neighborhood where they know their neighbors, you know, that they all feel safe and they get out and they know each other's names and they, they ask, how are you? The extent to which those neighbors don't change so often, right? And people aren't being evicted um, that live next to them. That makes them feel safer. We hope to generate actionable information that can be shared with a variety of early childhood stakeholders that can help to use this information to make, um, to make neighborhoods more equitable for young children, to give more children uh, equal opportunities. Wonderful, thank you so much. I wanna invite anybody that has a question for this team. Do you have any uh, questions that you would like to pose to the team? It looks like there's an anonymous one. Um, the question is around the idea of, let me see. It looks like different areas, did different areas have different ideas of how they uh, think about a holistic sort of person? Hi, this is Diane Horm. And um, relative to child development, when we talk about a holistic um, approach to understanding development, we're talking about understanding the various developmental domains, such as cognitive development, language development, social and emotional development, and physical development are the um, categories that we mostly speak about. All right, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one other question. Does anybody, does any, uh, do any of the panelists have a question for the team? Or is there anything that, to your presentation that you would like to add? Oh, there's a hand raised, let me see. Let's 
So I'm seeing a question in the Q&A box that's, can okay. you comment on the impact of health disparities on early childhood? And that's an area that we would really like to expand our research to um, look more closely at in future. Um, there's some suggestive evidence that attending a high quality early childhood program as a young child, um, there's been a long-term study that shows that men in their 40s and 50s have lower incidence of cardiac disease if they've attended an early childhood program that's high quality um, early on. And so that finding has been uh, very instrumental in the field of piquing people's interests to look at uh, more intentionally the connection between education and health, particularly starting in early childhood. So that's a future research direction for us. So check back in five, 10 years. Great. And then we have a hand raised and um... yeah, Nancy, if you can unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, that was actually earlier uh, when I couldn't Oh, okay. Hear yeah, I couldn't hear the discourse. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, OU Tulsa team. So we're going to move on to the next presentation, which is entitled, Not Disposable, Disability, Ableism, and Stigma in Oklahoma. That team consists of Aparna Nair, History of Science, Laura Martin, Oklahoma Historical Society, Ronald Schleffer, English, and Aaron Taylor, Oklahoma Developmental Disabilities Council. And we will have Michelle go ahead and start their talk. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about our project on um, disability and ableism in Oklahoma. Um, and um, before I begin, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, Erin Taylor at the Oklahoma Developmental Disabilities Council, Laura Martin at the Oklahoma Historical Society, and Ronald Schrieffer at the Honors College, um, who couldn't be here for this, but I'm presenting on behalf of all of us. I'd also like to thank um, the VPRP's office and the OU Humanities Forum for um, giving us the support for this project and for believing that it matters. Um, now, if I can just get this to work. Um, um, our project was impelled by the realization that it has never been more important for us to understand and center disability um, than it has been in the context of a global pandemic. Um, as someone who works on public health and disability, I've always been convinced of it of this, but um, in the middle of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, um, disabled people have been especially vulnerable. Not only are they more likely to test positive, they're also more likely to die than non-disabled people, as more and more studies suggest. Um, disa uh, disabled people in institutional spaces like nursing homes and other sp uh, institutions have also been proven to be especially vulnerable to both infection and are likely to experience higher mor mortality rates. Disabled people are also dying in younger age cohorts than non-disabled contemporaries. All things considered, the pandemic has revealed the existing um, um, uh, vulnerabilities experienced by disabled people and disabled populations, but has also exacerbated um, the um, vulnerabilities and, and inequities. Uh, it, I, I'd also like to point out that the pandemic has also produced some truly um, 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 disturbing uh, public and scientific discourse around disability. For example, the notion of, a, of um, herd immunity by infection has been discussed um, um, ad infinitum this, um, this year. And um, what has always struck most of us who work on disability as rather disturbing is that 
what that entails is a significant number of um, infections and deaths amongst uh, disabled people and disabled populations. Um, it's clear that the general structural and um, educational neglect um, around disability, the neglect of disability studies and disability history has contributed to um, the way we talk about disability in public and in scientific discourse and has actually exacerbated the pandemic. Um, and it's here that disability history can offer a really meaningful and, um, um, and important counter narrative um, to the um, ableism laid bare by the pandemic and simultaneously reveal the costs of ignoring disability um, as an axis of social difference, um, as a category of analysis, and um, especially uh, the cost of um, ignoring disability in medical and public health education. So we took a public and digital humanities approach to this project and our attempt um, um, to uh, at least pr provide something of a solution to the way disability has been talked about this year was to create an, um, a public um, mobile uh, digital and digital exhibit um, that showcases the histories of disability um, in all its complexities, um, both um, um, through stories and objects um, in this uh, focusing on the state of Oklahoma. And what we hope to do with this project is to get people thinking about um, disability um, in a meaningful sense, um, understanding both um, how, it ma how disability matters um, uh, on a policy level and, and in the context of public health, but also um, uh, we hope to educate um, people about ableism and stigma and the dangers of eugenics, especially. Um, so I'll give you a brief sense of what we've accomplished so far. Um, we've um, done some, uh, we've managed to do some really interesting things. And I'm, um, even if I say so myself, I'm really excited about this project. Uh, we managed to find um, some prosthetics um, uh, from um, uh, 19th century prosthetics. The one uh, that you're seeing here um, was one of our earliest finds. It was a um, prosthetic used by a farmer, um, a sharecropper in Oklahoma, in the state of Oklahoma. Um, his great, great, great um, uh, grandchildren were selling it on eBay and we were able to find it. And it's very clear that it's homemade. And um, we were also able to um, uh, get photographs of the farmer actually using the prosthetic and working his farm. So we hope to use um, objects like this to get a sense of the disabled experience in the state of Oklahoma. Um, we um, we went we tried we also found prosthetics um, that were um, more likely uh, more likely um, mass produced like the bucket leg that you're seeing on the left here and um, we um, also found um, prosthetic um, arms and orthotics um, are also a part of this exhibit um, we've also focused on technologies for the blind. Um, um, this is um, uh, another find of ours. Um, we found um, a, a pair of uh, glasses sold by, um, this is most likely about 100 years old, I think, um, by the Fletcher Optical Company in Muskogee. Um, but we've also been very lucky to uh, um, be able to borrow some of the older uh, Braille printers and uh, typewriters from the Oklahoma Library for the Blind who have been extraordinarily generous um, with their time and with their materials. Um, which will all, this will also be part of the exhibit. Um, um, we will also focus on the history of guide dogs um, in the state of Oklahoma, not just the dogs for um, trained to provide um, assistance to blind Oklahomans, but also um, 
all the way into the 21st century. Uh, dogs that are now uh, trained as service animals for people with a broad range of conditions. Um, we also focus on technologies of um, deafness, uh, like the ear trumpet, for example. We found um, two examples that I, you can see here. These are very um, uh, typical examples from the uh, 19th century. Um, and we try and balance um, uh, what uh, the material um, uh, objects that we find with narratives from the archive or from um, historical newspapers. This is actually a letter we found in the Tulsa Democrat um, where someone is actually asking for a ear trumpet for a relative. Um, we look at the evolution of um, ear trumpets, um, um, and, and these are two other examples that we have. Um, and um, into the 20th century, we also describe the other um, kinds of um, you know, um, the newer kinds of hearing aids. Um, from um, you know, uh, these are two examples. The one in the middle is called a Zenith hearing aid, and was uh, sold by mail in Oklahoma around the mid 20th century. Um, and the letter that you're seeing on the um, extreme right is actually um, was actually a, um, a, a letter to a doctor in um, in an Oklahoma newspaper. Uh, by um, uh, someone who seems to be um, hesitant to use a hearing aid. And the doctor responds by saying that the hearing aid would make her life um, better. Um, we also looked at institutions uh, for um, disabled Oklahomans, but we um, are not, um, uh, and, and we're looking at uh, the Oklahoma School for the Deaf in Muskogee, the um, School for the, um, I'm sorry, the School for the Blind in Muskogee, the School for the Deaf in Sulphur, um, as well as um, uh, Griffin um, and Taft. Um, these are and the Cherokee School for the um, um, a Cherokee Institution for the um, uh, for uh, disabled um, Native Americans, which was actually established in the mid um, um, in the 1860s. Actually, um, the um, um, another part of the exhibit also looks at um, um, eugenics in the state of Oklahoma. Um, and explores how um, exactly what it meant for everyday Oklahomans and how it had continued um, um, even past the um, 20th century, um, the, um, you know, the, um, the, um, um, even past World War II um, and the experiences of um, Native women in the Indian Health Services as well. Um, we also focus, uh, try and find, um, um, try to find um, letters and narratives um, um, from and about disabled people in the archive. We only had a few months for this, so we haven't uh, done as much as uh, we wanted, but we have found some really interesting things, like this letter, for example. Um, which we found um, um, sent to um, 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 uh, uh, B.F. Myers um, to New York, uh, to A.G. Leonard, and he asked for literature describing and stating the price um, of your invisible eardrum for uh, restarting the hearing of deaf people. Um, um, uh, so, you know, uh, these kinds of um, um, letters allow us little um, ingress into the disabled experience as well in Oklahoma beyond just objects um, and institutions and eugenics. Um, and we also try to tell the stories of um, focus on, on a few select um, Oklahomans. The, the one story that I find especially um, um, interesting to tell is that of Juanita Cotton, who was the first disabled woman in the School of Art at OU and was also the first black woman um, to graduate, uh, to go through the graduate program um, at the School of Art. Um, 
she was um, um, a, a, she was a fascinating woman, and she talked about um, how difficult it was to navigate the um, the inaccessible spaces of the campus in a wheelchair um, in the mid uh, in the in, in the nineteen sixties. Um, when she graduated, she talked about how difficult it was to get a job because. Um, as good as her CV was when she um, went to interview, she was both um, black and she was um, in a wheelchair. Um, she, however, had a um, long and successful career as an artist as, and as a teacher. Um, we have a lot left to do with this project. Um, but it has been a fantastic few months. Um, we've found some, um, what we need to do is find more personal narratives of disability in the archive, if, if that is truly possible. We were very lucky to be working on this while the Oklahoma Historical Society was also pulling together a finding aid on disability in Oklahoma um, and um, to work with the people there. We also need to make our exhibit um, truly accessible. So one of the things we have to work on doing in the next um, month or so is to create braille labels for our exhibit. Um, at this moment, we have, um, uh, we know that the exhibit is going up in the Oklahoma Historical Society's um, display um, space, and we're really excited about that. Um, but um, the o um, uh, Health Sciences Library um, has also indicated that they would like to have the um, the uh, exhibit up there, um, which would be great. Um, and um, that's, all, that's all I have for you now. Um, I'm look, I look forward to um, any comments or questions you have. Thank you very much. Can't hear Laura. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you for that wonderful presentation. So we have a couple of minutes for questions on that presentation. And I know like I, I had a question myself and I'm really curious about um, how you might delve into other disabilities like uh, neurodiverse folks or um, like things like lupus, because I know both of those, especially lupus, I've seen it quite a bit in the indigenous communities in Oklahoma. So yeah, I was just wondering, wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. So um, ideally this project should um, would take me years and I would, um, uh, I would um, if I wanted to put the, include um, conditions like that, I would, ideally collect oral histories. And that's, um, you know, that's the gold standard. What I do know is that the Oklahoma Historical Society is currently working on collecting oral histories from disabled Oklahomans, but they're currently focusing on um, intellectual disabilities and, and not uh, necessarily um, conditions like lupus. But you're, you're entirely right. There are both environmental and structural reasons why conditions like lupus kind of um, concentrate in certain populations. Uh, and this, uh, um, you know, for instance, um, the prevalence of amputation and uh, higher rates of amputations in both native and in African-American populations is because of structural reasons and historical trauma and uh, lack of access to healthcare um, in a timely manner. Um, and the high uh, prevalence of um, conditions like diabetes. So I really would be interested in doing this and uh, it would, uh, best be accomplished, I think, through oral histories. To my knowledge, there aren't actually many histories of conditions like lupus. And what was the first one you were asking? Neurodiversity, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we did actually find some interesting uh, letters in the archive. Um, I'm epileptic myself, and um, we found a letter from a 12-year-old uh, um, native, uh, I think she was Kiowa, a uh, um, um, young girl who was advocating to be allowed into an institution 
Um, she wrote letters to uh, physicians and to the directors of the um, 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 of various homes asking to be allowed to enter the institution. Um, so epilepsy is, of course, considered as part of, um, you know, diversity by some. Um, but, um, um, you know, again, it also includes things like autism. The um, when we start thinking about it, that disability, you know, is, is an umbrella term that includes so much, it's truly impossible for us to cover everything. And that's not an excuse I'm making. It's just, you know, um, uh, it's, there will always be things that, um, you know, we miss out on. So neurodiversity is, we have, we do have some, um, discuss it to some extent in the, especially in the context of, um, eugenics in the um, in the 19th century um, and the uh, first half of the 20th century, um, but beyond that, um, what I would like to do is to track and um, record the histories of communities of neurodiverse folk not in in Oklahoma, and how they've used community and disability identity and disability pride to counter. Um, you know, uh, structural neglect and institutional neglect in the state, which is um, quite common. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Are there any other questions? Okay. So our next presentation is Let's see, machine learning, machine learning methods to understand and identify health disparity outcomes among women in minority groups. That team consists of Zubair Mula from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, and Talia Razagi with Industrial and Systems Engineering. And I will turn it over to Michelle to start their presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, my name is Talaya Razari. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at ODU. Today, I'm going to present my research, which is about understanding a severe pregnancy complication called preeclampsia using predictive models. This is a joint work with my medical collaborator, Dr. Zuber Mula from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, and my graduate research assistant, Rachel Bennett. My talk will be mostly about the significance of this problem and how we adapt deep neural networks as a tool to understand and predict the complication. According to Mayo Clinic, preeclampsia is a pregnancy complication characterized by high blood pressure and signs of damage uh, to other uh, organ systems, most often the liver and kidneys. Uh, it usually begins after 20 weeks of pregnancy in women whose blood pressure had been normal. Preeclampsia actually affects two to eight percent pregnancies worldwide. In the US alone, it's the cause of 15% of premature birth. But it is uh, even more serious because if it is left untreated, then it may le even lead to fatal complications for both mother and baby. It is actually called eclampsia in that case, which may cause seizure or coma. In fact, according to CDC, about 8.3% of pregnancy-related deaths between 2008 and 2017 has been preeclampsia and eclampsia. Also based on the statistics, preeclamptic patients have longer stays in hospitals. Uh, here in the, uh, the orange bars show the average length of stay for preeclamptic pregnancies, and the gray bars show the same for non-preeclamptic pregnancies. You can verify that the length of stay for pregnancies with preeclampsia may be close to twice of that for pregnancies without preeclampsia. Here are a few more statistics which are adopted from Preeclampsia Foundation. For example, the U.S. is ranked 47th globally for the maternal mortality rate and the maternal death rate continues to rise despite major advancements in medical technology and treatments. 
Women who experience preeclampsia are four times more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So there are also other measurements, but I assume everyone will get access to this slide later. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to read over all of them. However, there is one good news that I want to share. About 60% of maternal death due to preeclampsia are actually preventable. This, is, uh, this justifies our efforts to be able to work on the idea of having a recommendation system that can measure the risk of developing preeclampsia way ahead of 20th uh, week. I have another informative plot here, which actually conveys not a very good news. We know that US has a high rural population which in turn results in disparities in maternal mortality rates. According to Moadab et al, interstate uh, differences in maternal mortality ratios largely reflect that there is a statistical correlation between a state-wise maternal mortality, rural status or poverty, and non-Hispanic black population. As also seen in this figure, among different U.S. states, the maternal mortality ratio is pretty high in the state of Texas and Oklahoma. We have decided to study and validate our models using the data sets related to these two states. As you see in this plot, significant racial disparities can be observed in maternal mortality rate. For example, it's been reported that American Indian and black women are two to three times as likely to die from a pregnancy related cause than white women. Also, the data shows that these gaps persisted over time. Now the conventional diagnosis for preeclampsia is prone to two types of errors. First, it could be the case that the woman has preeclampsia, but we fail to diagnose it. Obviously, this results in increased rate of more untreated cases of preeclampsia, which means higher mortality and morbidity. Second, it could be the case that the woman is healthy, but we treat her as a preeclamptic patient. In this case, the outcome is higher rate of early deliveries and higher rate of premature infants, which consequently means that we pay more, of, more for NICU costs. Just to get a sense of these costs, uh, we have spent $26 billion in 2019 for premature babies in NICU. I hope you now see that improving the early uh, and reliable diagnosis of preeclampsia is vital. Our hypothesis is that uh, predictive models can significantly help detecting preeclampsia in early stages. How does that help? Well, we can think of uh, it as this closed loop system. So a pregnant woman visits her doctor and a, an array of uh, various information is collected during this visit. For example, blood pressure, urine tests, history of medical treatments, and so on. This information is then fed into the predictive model, which has been built based on several thousands or even hundreds of thousands of health records of similar cases. The output of the model is a recommendation system. Uh, and to be more precise, it is going to be the likelihood of developing preeclampsia using the information collected at this stage of pregnancy. The doctor still plays the most significant role here by making the decisions about the next actions or any intervention required. But we believe the recommendation, which is based on several key features, is helpful. Now, in the next visit, a new record of patients will be collected and a new recommendation is made. This loop continues until the, pre the pregnancy is over. Of course, the key question is how to come up with a reliable and accurate predictive model. So here are the research, research goals that we have targeted in this research. As the first goal, we would like to develop an explainable AI model that can detect high-risk patients at earlier stages. What do I mean by explainable? 
it means we want to be able to interpret the results of the model. As the second goal, we want to design this model in such a way that it is robust to common challenges such as imbalanced data, missing values, categorical features. We are studying the data of the state of Oklahoma and Texas in this study, and uh, we are currently performing preliminary study using 2013 Texas public use data files. Uh, so uh, also we are uh, at the final stage of the IRB process to access the 2018 Texas research data files. Now, why choosing 2013 Texas data? Because as you can see from this plot, disparities is evident in this data, which makes it a good candidate to validate our models. The 2013 Texas PUDF sets has about 360K total samples that includes four-person preeclamptic patients. Our clinical experts suggested to include 52 features, which 47 of them are clinical features and five of them are demographic. We are also using 2017 and 2018 Oklahoma PUDF, which consists of 84K samples in total and 5.5% of them are preeclinic. We considered features similar to what we have considered in Texas data. The, the challenges can be considered in five dimensions. First, imbalanceness, which is roughly speaking a severe skewness in data. More about this to be explained next. Second, data cleaning and preparation and clinical features are identified using ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. Third, sparsity and high dimensional features. Of course, adding categorical features increases the sparsity in data and is problematic to deal with. Fourth, missing values, which can reduce the statistical power of a study and can produce bias estimates. And finally, potentially large data sets, which require a special care. Preeclampsia occurrence is rare. Between three and 5% of patients are preeclamptic in the state of Texas and Oklahoma. This is an imbalanced classification problem. Since the example of one class is greatly outnumbered the examples of the other class. And also the detection of preeclamptic patients is more crucial compared to identifying non preeclamptic in individuals. Also using our preliminary study with the 2013 Texas PUDF, we have observed that there are 0.25% missing values in race and 0.94% missing values in ethnicity, which are very small. We select important features in two stages. First, our clinical experts select the main features, and then these features are given to the feature selection algorithm, which identifies the final set of significant features. This two-stage procedure enables us to incorporate both the clinical experts and the statistics theory to choose the most significant factors. One well-known technique is called Excubus algorithm that we utilize in this procedure. The outcome has been a list of 20 features, and some of the most important ones are hypertension, multiple gestation, pre-existing diabetes, obesity, age less than 20 and above 40. In our preliminary study, we have tried a couple of machine learning tools, but we are convinced that um, neural networks are the most appropriate machine learning uh, technique for our task. Why? One main reason is that we have categorical data, which tends to yield high dim dimensional data sets, i.e. data sets with a lot of features. The other main reason is the number of observations. Deep learning has been remarkable in working with massive size, high dimensional data sets. Our Oklahoma data has above 50K records, and especially the Texas data set will have close to 40K records. So choosing deep learning is a good choice. This is an ongoing research and we are working to improve the accuracy of the algorithm in the presence of imbalanceness and a lot of categorical features. As of now, 
Just using our preliminary results, we have generated model uh, with close to 70% accuracy, but there are different aspects of neural network that we are working on to improve the results. With this, I would like to sincerely appreciate the funding opportunity provided by the OUVPRP and many thanks for listening to this presentation. Wonderful, thank you. We have a few minutes for questions as well on this one. So if anyone has any questions and I will actually kick it off again because you know, I see this, this thing rolling forward from the previous presentation, especially around eugenics and with uh, Native women being um, forcefully sterilized in the 60s at IHS. And I've done body mapping with um, Indigenous women about how they feel entering IHS, and they still feel unsafe. This goes for Black women as well. And so, you know, as I was listening to... Um, this presentation and I'm thinking about like some of the talks around indigenous um, AI and how you can sort of have be in conversation with community and invoke indigenous research methods and epistemologies to shape that. And so one of the things that struck me that if there's an overrepresentation of black and indigenous mothers, you know, uh, and preeclampsia and morbidity, um, like how can you maybe shape an AI approach that brings in um, the idea of black and indigenous feminisms around relationality? So how might you measure and think about that felt knowledge that the mothers carry and how they feel being in this space where they actually feel unsafe within the healthcare system? So I was just wondering, wondering like how, um, equity might be placed into that because there's like a lot of indicators that are existing data, but how might you work with, or could you work with community to pull in that aspect of relationality? Uh, all right, uh, Zuber, would you like to answer or would you like me to answer this question? Okay, I can, I can go ahead. Um, actually, um, you know, uh, one of the big challenges in this data is um, um, actually the uh, health disparities. Uh, as you know, uh, the number of uh, women uh, in black population and uh, American Indian population is pretty small. So we try to modify our, algo our algorithm, our uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence based algorithm to understand this and try to uh, produce fair results based on the distribution of data because uh, actually, um, you know, in this population, we have a large number of uh, patients who have preeclampsia and who have, who are black, for example. How we can uh, uh, actually work on the algorithm and improve the algorithm to deal with such issue, which is a real data issue, uh, real data distribution issue. So this is an ongoing research and uh, we try to work with, uh, you know, uh, a weighting strategy and different methods that are uh, av uh, available and there are different methods that uh, actually are more uh, efficient for imbalanced data sets. And uh, we are trying to come up with a new algorithm at the end. You know, we are still working on this as, uh, algorithm. Yep. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from Aparna and it was around sort of related how machine learning can incorporate these historical factors that are predetermined of and in interwoven and interwoven into many of the variables you mentioned. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Um, we are trying to consider, you know, different uh, clinical features and different factors um, based on uh, our clinical uh, experts' opinion uh, in the first stage. And the second stage, we, we are going to use a uh, machine learning based feature selection algorithm to identify uh, this significant risk factors. So this is the second stage that we did. Uh, through this process. And of course, uh, there are 
you know, a lot of features and risk factors to consider, but we should come up with the ones that are more significant that machine learning or AI based algorithm can generate more accurate results for us. Thank you. And if so, I just could chime in real quick, this is Zubair. Sure. So thank, th you. thank you, uh, Talia. Uh, uh, yes, so um, uh, definitely focusing on uh, indigenous populations um, is of interest to us in this project. Um, sometimes we are hampered by small numbers and, but uh, definitely we could supply the group with more references if you're interested. There was a paper this year in the journal Maternal Fetal and Neonatal Medicine that looked at mom's race and ethnicity. And so we could also send you information on, uh, so for example, among Native American women in that uh, study, uh, of those who had preeclampsia, 38% of those among the Native American group were severe, um, classified as severe preeclampsia, but among white non-Hispanics, that percentage was 35%. So um, yeah, so there's different endpoints, but here in this study, we're predicting the presence of preeclampsia. The study I'm just citing right now is once you have it, what are some predictors of poor outcomes? So again, um, uh, allostatic load, lifetime of racism, microaggressions, when a lot of things affect a pregnancy. So, um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zuber. Thank you. Thank you, team. So we're going to move on to the last presentation entitled Community-Led Policy and Design, a Multidisciplinary Think Tank. And that team consists of Andrea Benjamin with African and African American Studies, uh, Vanessa Morrison and Deborah Richardson with or Richards, I'm sorry, in architecture. So I will turn it over to Michelle to start that. Hi, my name is Andrea Benjamin. I'm going to be talking to you today about community-led policy and design, a multidisciplinary think tank. Uh, I'm representing my co-PIs, Vanessa Morrison and Deborah Richards, both in the College of Architecture. First, just to get started, we wanted to just give an overview of Oklahoma City. As you can see in 1954, we see a lot of density and housing. And by 2017, the northeast side of Oklahoma City just doesn't look like that, largely due to urban renewal. The goals of our think tank are really thinking about a community engaged think tank where the community voice is centered. We do focus on Oklahoma City's black, uh, historically black side of town, the northeast side of Oklahoma City. And our goal is to uh, reduce the inherent bias that researchers and scholars normally bring into those communities. Um, and we operate from not a deficit model, but from a resource model, an abundance model that the community has what it needs. They know what they need. And it's our job to try to hear those things and, and learn from them. We do have a community partner, again, Vanessa Morrison is in the College of Architecture, but she's also a co-founder of Black Space Oklahoma, which really centers Black communities, tries to strengthen them, and, um, you know, just, just really uh, is a great organization. So we're very thankful that Vanessa can sort of do both of those things and wear both of those hats in our think tank. Again, so thinking about the goals of our think tank, we want to hear from underrepresented populations, communities. We want to center those stories, center those experiences, and help students think about the ways that we can address those uh, inequities in the community and also in the classroom. So we hired our students and it was really great the way we came together and sort of landed on this idea that one of the biggest challenges in the Northeast side is the food desert. And so we'll get into that, um, but we have questions such as what happened to the other grocery stores and how do policymakers and community members work together and, and bring change to their community? We're also interested in the way the in urban environment will be affected by the two new grocery stores and thinking about how citizens can participate in changing their urban environment. Um, and so we wanna develop relationships with the community. And again, the goal is for us and our students to reduce that inherent bias uh, when, that often is, takes place when engaging with communities. So the Northeast side, East side, as it were, uh, is made up of four zip codes. Unfortunately, these are in the top 10 of the poorest 
uh, zip codes in Oklahoma. You can see the poverty rates here. They are also among the top 10 in the blackest zip codes in the state. So you can see that that ranges from 82 to 89% black. Again, it is considered a food desert currently, and a food desert is defined here, right? So we're talking about places where communities don't have access to fresh, healthy, and affordable food. That might look like a convenience store, that might look like uh, maybe one market, but there's just not readily available, healthy and fresh, affordable foods in those communities. And we care about these things because it really is a public health issue. Uh, there can be a lot of challenges when communities don't have access to healthy and fresh and affordable food. So we found a study that was done by the Lynn Institute in 2016 and you know, getting a sense of where were people shopping, where are people getting their food? And you can see that about a third of the respondents get their food from Buy for Less. There's another more community locally owned store, Otwells. And when asked what would help the people in the East Side consistently eat a nutritious diet, the number one answer, almost 40% said access. And I think that's really important, again, thinking about centering the community. It's not that the community doesn't want health, fresh and affordable foods, it's that they don't have access to them. And I think that's really important. And again, thinking about centering that narrative versus people don't want those things. They do want those things, but they need to have access to them if that's going to be a possibility. So here's a map, thanks to Deborah and her great skills. And so as you can see, the highlighted area are those zip codes that I just laid out. And right now, really the only grocery store is the Sunshine Market. And there are buy for less options, uh, grocery stores, but they're not accessible. And so again, thinking about that access question. So we're interested in how the new grocery stores that are coming, which there are two new grocery stores coming, how will that affect the urban environment and a sense of community and well-being among the residents? So as you can see on this map, there will be two new grocery stores. Those are roughly where they're going to be located. And I know it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, maybe Deborah can send us a bigger map, but you can see that there are convenience stores and you can also see where the old grocery stores used to be. So um, for instance, here at the corner of Northeast 23rd and Martin Luther King, there was a grocery store there, but it was closed. So just keeping those things in mind. So again, we hired our students. And so there are two students from AFAM um, taking classes with me. And then there are two students from architecture. So that was our, that completes our think tank. And so we're really thankful for the students because it was really they, uh, them and their research that led to the food desert as being our topic. So we really appreciate them. And they did their research. They looked around and again, it was just good timing that these two new grocery stores were about to you know, uh, be opened in the next year. So these are our students in our think tank. We did a photo shoot as part of our website and our social media. And so we'll get to that, but this is them looking like they're working very hard on the think tank and, and, this, and this topic. So what do we plan to deliver? One is a website that we want to use to provide visual content like the maps that you saw earlier that Deborah made. We also plan to have some basic facts sheets there, just information, um, you know, just a, a hub so that the community can access the information. But then also we wanna do a podcast. So the goal is to conduct interviews with some key policymakers, stakeholders and community members. Um, but then those episodes will really be accessible to the community and we are working on ways that we can roll that out and make sure that the community knows what we're working on. Um, and, and so that's really a big part of what we're doing. As you can see here, um, I'll try to just go through the list briefly, but you know, a couple key people, right? So we have experts uh, even on our own campus who study food deserts. We wanna talk to them to help us place our you know, community in that context. We'll hear, we, we hope to speak to Willa Johnson, who is the first black woman to serve on the Oklahoma City Council. She represented the East Side. She's considered one of the founding people that really asked for the grocery stores, bringing it all the way to current times to Council Member Nice, who's really you know uh, been uh, active. And this is a big deal for her in her tenure to be able to say, under my watch, I help bring these grocery stores. Obviously we wanna to talk to the mayor, um, but we also wanna hear from service providers. So who, 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 who at the regional food bank knows how to serve our community, what our community is asking for, how do schools sometimes fill that gap when there's a food desert for students? And then thinking about public transportation, so Embark, how do they factor in here? Thinking about the design piece, uh, 
Monarch Properties is designing one of the grocery stores. And then thinking about the public-private partnership that really took place to bring these to fruition. So we want to talk to the CEO of Homeland. We want to talk to some of the funders that, that really helped bring the project together. The Alliance for Economic Development, First State Bank, they brought this funding. There were some tax incentives. How, did that, how does that factor in? Thinking about other opportunities, the Innovation District will be on the east side. What does that do? How is that a factor? And then thinking about who's already doing that work. So Restore Oklahoma City, Restore OKC, they're part of one of the grocery stores, but they're currently trying to serve the community and giving them access to food. What's their role here? What's the media's role? What have other elected officials? So we talked about the city level elected officials, but we also have state house and Senate representation. How do those representatives uh, factor in here? Thinking about what does this mean for minority health and equity? And then again, really grounding the community. So through our neighborhood organizations, uh, the JFK neighborhood, Culberson East Highlands, uh, some of the other neighborhoods and the neighborhood alliance, how do we hear from the community about what they're thinking about the grocery stores and how they plan to proceed. So our next steps, we're working on our interviews, we're working on our social media, we're preparing our episodes, and we are working on getting grants. We think this is a really important and worthwhile project. And so we did submit uh, one big grant in September and we plan to move forward, even if we don't, uh, you know, grants are hard, uh, but we plan to move forward with two other grant opportunities in the coming year to think about ways that we can fund this work. And so thank you for listening to this little overview about our project and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. So we have a few minutes before the keynote uh, for some questions. Anybody out there have a question for this group, for this team? I, well, you've certainly packed a lot into like nine something minutes. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's just really interesting seeing like everyone's presentation and how some folks are contending with the built environment. It's almost like a 360 view of community. So that's, it's really great work. Let's see, it looks like we might have a question here. Okay, um, so we have a question. Is the fact of past closures what usually keeps no, new grocery stores out? I have no idea how store siting works. Sure, so that's something that we're actually working on and it is an important question, um, right? Because, you know, I, I see that this person, Claire, Claire, is thinking about this from an economic standpoint, right? If a grocery store already closed, isn't the signal then that the community couldn't support it. But I'm not quite sure if that sums up this exact situation. I think there were some tough calls that were made, um, but I think moving forward, the, the goal is that, you know, obviously it is a homeland that that is coming to 36 and Lincoln. Um, and one thing about that grocery store is it is um, worker owned. And so that's a really unique model. And so the hope I think is that, that it'll just be a different community relation, but it is also true, at least in informal conversations that when I asked uh, certain people, how did we end up with a homeland? <clears throat> and their response was that they asked everyone, homeland's the one that said yes, right? And so it is an economic business model so yeah, we're hoping that you know when when these two open, uh, we can you know sort of prove that 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 we'll be good customers and that it'll keep there. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely I mean it's just economics. And so again, I know I went over a lot very briefly, but it is a true public private partnership. And so the the final pieces of funding, they came with tax incentives, and that's just a fact, right? So it's not goodwill that the banks were like, here's the money for your grocery store, right? They're getting something from it. So I mean, we we have to keep those things in mind as well. Okay, and we have a question in the chat. Um, so, great presentation. Any insights, research on how nonprofits, which aim to serve the community, can avoid, avoid the inherent bias in trying to serve? For example, organizations from outside of Northeast Oklahoma City or predominantly white perspectives, et cetera. Yeah, that's such a great question. Thank you. Um, that is exactly what we are working on. And I should say, um, again, you know, Vanessa Morrison, who's part of this project, Deborah herself, myself, we're all committed to this community. And so I think one thing that comes through in almost everything we do is that we want to try to avoid that bias. And so we understand our positionality, right? When I come to do things, people know I have a PhD and I know that that brings a certain responsibility. But again, 
we really believe that the community has what it needs and they have the capability to tell us what it needs. And so our job then is only to support that. And so, yeah, we, you know, we are very aware that there is burnout on the east side. There are data has been collected so many times and guess what? The community never even comes back to share the results with them. That's actually really bad and terrible and scary research practice. And so again, the podcast was chosen. We had a lot of conversations even before, while we were writing the grant. And the podcast was chosen because here's what the community is not gonna read, a paywall journal article. That's that's a fact, right? So that the, the output, the deliverable that we propose was really grounded in access. Now we still have some work to do. It's not that everyone sits around listening to podcasts like I do, um, but so we're working with our community organization connections to make sure that once the podcast comes out that it is accessible and it is available and that our community is aware of it. So for sure, it's a challenge. Um, I'm in a lot of rooms and conversations. It's, it's something that a lot of people are talking about. How do we reduce that bias and especially thinking about insider versus outsider status. So how do we manage that? Um, and again, we, at least on our think tank, we all, some of the, many of the students have ties to these side too. So we are really trying to, uh, to, to work around that, but we do know that it's an important issue and we're trying to address it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we're gonna close up the Q&A right now, but we're gonna hang on to your questions for the round table. So right now I'm gonna move into the keynote and I have the pleasure of introducing Ihoma Iruka of University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and Dr. Iruka is a research professor in the Department of Public Policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She also serves as fellow at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute and director of the Equity Research Action Coalition at Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute. Previously, she was the, the Chief Research Innovation Officer at High Score Educational Research Foundation, Director of Research at the Buffett Institute at the University of Nebraska, and Associate Director and Scientist at FPG, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, Dr. Iruka is trained in applied developmental psychology and investigates how evidence-informed policies, systems, and practices in early education can support the optimal development of children from marginalized communities. Her work is focused on family engagement and asset development, quality rating and improvement systems and early care and education systems and programs. She has been engaged in addressing how best to ensure healthy development and excellence for young diverse learners, especially black children through equity focused family, classroom and policy tools, the examination of non-traditional pedagogical approaches and public policies. Dr. Iruka's professional committee work includes the Brady Education Foundation and the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine on supporting parents of young children and applying neurobiological and socio-behavioral sciences from prenatal through early childhood development, a health equity approach. Her talk today is entitled Ensuring Youth Well-Being and Excellence Through a Racial Equity Lens. So please help me welcome Dr. Iruka. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. It's been, it's a pleasure. Can you hear me okay? Because I guess I'm the only one who's really live today, like yeah. really live. Uh, good. Okay, good. Um, well, I'm so thrilled. Thank you so much, Dr. Harjo, right? How do you pronounce your name, Laura? Last Harjo. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harjo. Well, I appreciate you uh, introducing me and just thank you for being part of, uh, making me part of this hair symposium. So I'm going to share my screen and then we're going to get jump started. Um, I should have taped my, like everybody else, and you won't see the madness of my house and my <laughs> young children. Because I'm in the East Coast, so clearly we're an hour ahead. So, you know, there's always madness um, in my household. So hopefully you can see my, my screen. And you can just see the um, presentation slides. Um, and of course, I wish I'm like, oh, I should have done all these videos, but it's okay. I wouldn't have had time to watch it. But I'm glad that there's alignment with what I was going to talk about and a lot of what the presenters talked about. So um, as Dr. Harajo has already sort of noted the title of my talk and sort of where I'm from, and I kind of want to set it off with sort of what I thought would be a good background to really, I think, fully connect the talks in a way, at least from my perspective. 
So I want to kind of start off with this figure, which comes from the National Equity Project. And really, this figure to me is important both for my work and hopefully to challenge all of you guys in your work. Right. So this figure really talks about how does structure racism link with implicit bias, right? So structure racism in essence, it's a, a system that has created, you know, white privilege and whiteness as being the best um, and created white supremacy. And then at the same time, also oppress those who are not white, right? And so, and part of the racism is more of the structure, right? So policies, whether around education, whether around food deserts, as the, the, the previous speakers just talked about, access to health care, education, residential segregation, right? Like those are actually policies that were in the books. Um, and part of that was because they want to sort of keep both the, the sort of, as part of keeping sort of this power imbalance between white majority and non-white. And really, it was really to continue to foster this idea of first, we tried to eradicate the natives. And then at the same time, we tried to, we basically enslaved black people. So really the, the policies was to, was to maintain that institution institution of privilege and oppression. And with that, it creates these disparities that we see, whether in health, um, as we saw with the other speakers around eclampsia, or even around food deserts, or even around early kid education and neighborhoods. So it creates all these disparities. And then these disparities create the narratives, right? That certain groups of people are gonna be unhealthy and die, or um, that certain people are gonna be disabled and it's their fault, right? So it creates this narrative about certain groups of people, particularly people in poverty, people of color, people of, uh, of native origins. And so it, it primes us to think of, see people in a particular way. And then because we're primed to think that way, we then create policies that in some ways continue to maintain the status quo, right? So for example, the food desert question, which I teach thought was very interesting, right? Um, that why is it that the stores um, or the grocery stores aren't sort of uh, coming? This is because of money. Well, yes and no. But if you think about it from a historical point of view, you understand that when the federal government in essence created um, this, this you know, uh, segregation and redlining, right? Black, high black majority areas were actually redlined. So they couldn't actually access loans in the same way that white majority places could. And so there's a level of both oppression, but also this investment, even lack of investment. And that has created sort of that sort of disparities and access to basic things like food, health, all those kinds, school and all that stuff. And then we then say, oh, well, you know, these economic grocery stores can't do it because, you know, there's no money there. Well, yeah, you have historically and consistently disinvested or uninvested in those communities. And so this, this narrative continues that says, well, I'm not gonna come to this grocery store or this place because you have no money. Well, you, I don't have any money because of the history, right? So it becomes sort of this <laughs> cycle that blames the victim for like, oh, it's your fault you don't have a grocery store. No, it's really the history is why I don't have a grocery store in my neighborhood because you created it that way. And so I think as you think of the work that you do, it's to not just place it in the current times, but think of it from a much more historical point of view and not, and, and also decenter it from individuals as if it's individual's fault, right? It's my fault that I happen to be disabled. No, it's, it's not my fault, right? It's not necessarily my fault, but are there things that we can do to, to heal and harm and provide opportunities? So, so I hope that people looking at this figure will understand that the questions have to be more nuanced and really ask, well, why is it this community? And why is it, and why is it, and go dig deeper. Right, because the idea is that we're trying to get to equity. We have to know what we're trying to reach for, right? It's not that we want everybody to have the same exact grocery store. It's not that we want everybody to be the same weight. We want everybody to be healthy. And so the job of the whole idea of equity is that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to thrive and reach their potential, right? So that means that, that so for, for, for mothers, particularly native mothers or black mothers who are at higher risk of eclampsia, but really higher risk of maternal morbidity and mortality is that we have to reduce that inequity that exists. Again, not because of them, right? It's not because, oh, you happen to be obese or you don't eat well against some of the narrative that is that historically racism has created the toxicity that then makes certain groups of women their, their, their fertile, their, their body much more stressed, which we know from science literally creates a lot of toxicity that then puts them at higher risk, right? So it's not just, oh, you don't eat well, you don't exercise. And then obviously there's other systematic things that happen, like doctors not, you know, seeing the signs of things, viewing certain particular people in a certain way. So again, when we think about issues of equity, we have to think of it from a historical point of view and also think about it from the biases that exist that we then excuse to say, oh, it's probably because you're fat or because you're poor or because you're disabled, but as opposed to looking from a systematic point of view. 
So as you sort of do your research and continue your research, um, I want you, I want to push you to really understand that your research has power and it could be for good or for bad, right? That is something we have to understand is that research just, you're doing research because it's interesting, great. But remember that your research could be actually weaponized. And that's something that I think all of us have to be really attentive to, especially when you're doing research that includes communities that have been historically marginalized or, or oppressed, et cetera. We have to understand that that research has power for good or for bad, right? And so I give you this example from the Moynihan Report, right? And so this report is from the 1960s. That really the report was written by, you know, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and he was an American psychologist, and he was um, serving as assistant secretary um, under uh, President Lyndon Johnson. And in his report, he really focused on what is the roots of black poverty in America? And he just concluded that it's basically because, you know, black mothers are having babies out of wedlock, right? And he talked about the, the, the tangle of pathologies and, and, and that because of this rise in black single motherhood, that is the undoing of the black family, but not the fact that there's not a lack, there's lack of jobs, the fact that it's racism, Jim Crow, uh, inequities, historical, we're still doing a lot of enslavement policies, segregation, yada, yada, yada. There's a whole host of things that creates that black men may not be around, not because of the, they don't want to, because of historical, long-term historical atrocities put on black families, black men in particular being, you know, obviously lynched. We have a lot of lynches that happen. You know, so, and then don't forget a lot of these sort of uh, um, um, uh, analyses resulted in policies that, to, that we feel today. Like today, we know that one out of three black men are likely to be in prison in a lifetime. And then one out of six Latino men, you know, are likely to be in prison in a lifetime. Those kind of studies, right? So he's a sociologist who studied big data, right? So those of us who love data, I'm a data analyst, I love data, big data. You have to be careful how you use that data, right? Because the data can then create policies that live into a lifetime. So the fact that his work happened in 1960s, it then created policies, you know, like on the war on poverty, part of those policies is really about how do you make sure that black women in particular or women who are poor and other marginalized communities don't have a lot of babies, right? We have cases of 5,000 black women were sterilized here in, in, in North Carolina where I live. And, and then I think the other 2000 were native women, right? They were sterilized because not because they wanted it, right? So this is the kind of thing that happen when we use research in a way that basically creates a pathology about a group of people. Um, and so that's something that really important that we wanna make note of. And so I would argue that as you think about your research, I also push you to think about what are the the policy implications, what are the practice implications, right? So for the report I just highlighted for you, the Moynihan report, which is, that's what it's known by, you can Google it, right? Is that it did sort of try to focus on what can we do for poor families, et cetera, right? And, and those kind of reports have helped us to establish the SNAP program, right? The Nutritional Assistance Program. It helped us establish, you know, tax credit, earned income tax credit, particularly for families who are working families, housing subsidies, school lunch programs, Medicaid and CHIP, um, expansion of Medicaid. So there's a lot of things that have focused on poverty reduction. And I think as you all do your work, I really want you to sort of think about what are the implications of your work? Because when I go down the chain of all the different speakers, right? from the work from the ECEI group, right, with Sherry and team, right, they look at both, you know, you know, children's development within the neighborhood space. It's not just thinking about it from a positive, like a poverty lens only. Think of it from a racialized lens, right? Because I can argue, I have been to Oklahoma and I've been to Oklahoma City, and I would argue that a lot of your low wealth, low income neighborhoods are likely to have a lot of families of color, particularly black families. And so when you look at your data, make sure that you don't look at it from just the contemporary lens, but looking from a historical lens. What does that mean when you are living in a community that has literally either dealt with, you know, burning of buildings, the disinvestment, crime, lack of access to health, education, re basic resources, and police violence, all those kind of things. Imagine the impact on children. So when you look at it, don't just look at it from sort of like, oh, it's a poor neighborhood with abandoned buildings. Look at it from a much deeper uh, insight as to what does that mean, right? Similarly with the issues of, of, of those who are experiencing dis disability is right, when you put the intersectional lens 
a both disability, a person of color or a woman, what does that tell us in terms of outcomes, in terms of well-being, and in terms of stigma sort of in, in, in Oklahoma as, as their studies were doing. And then similarly with the idea of the eclampsia, right? Again, you look, look at your model and think about how much would AI capture the historical impact of racism, right? You can have sort of certain demographic characteristics, but does it fully capture racism and all of its trauma and all of its ills? And so I love the question that was asked around the relational piece, right? It, it is, is relational, but also historical, right? How does an AI sort of approach take into account the, 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 the historical nature and the impact, the intergenerational impact of trauma that has been created, especially when you can't touch racism, you know it's there because the disparities, the disparities are the reasoning, right? For the racial, for the racial differences is really racism, right? How do you capture that racism at multiple levels in an AI? And so I think I can, I, I urge you all to really push on it. And of course, for the work with, with uh, Andrea Benjamin and her team is again, continue to think through the lens of how do you push on the idea that some of the things that you're seeing in terms of food deserts, what are the implications both in terms of a historical and contemporary, but also in terms of sort of future wise, right? As we think about COVID-19 and its impact, how does a food desert, you know, how does that happen? What are the implications for families' well-being and outcomes and even their level of just feeling like they're human, right? When you don't have food, there's a sense of loss and helplessness. What does that mean for a community at large? Um, and then how does a new grocery store help to either hopefully shore up the feeling of safe and safety um, and without, I think, abusing the community, right? Because you can say, well, we, we can be, yeah, you can, you can kind of, uh, as a new grocery store, you can kind of take the, the sort of the lens of, well, you're lucky we're here versus we are so glad to be here to finally meet the needs of the community versus, well, you're lucky we're here because nobody else wanted to be here, right? So I think it's to begin to to, 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 to go deeper as to what is the, the role of a grocery store um, in terms of creating a space of healing, but also a space of providing like uh, information that this community is thriving, is, but we have to invest it in a very thoughtful way. So I really sort of implore every single sort of group to really think really, really in a way that brings in a much stronger anti-racist lens and racial equity lens, because you are in a community that has historical legacy of, of racism, right? And so I think to, to make sure that you're not ignoring it and sort of coding it with sort of like poverty, neighborhoods to be very direct and very explicit because I think when you're explicit, the policies and the practices are also explicit. So now, if you ask me, how can you use more of an anti-racist and culturally grounded lens, right? And so when I think about the Moynihan report, and during that same time that Moynihan wrote his report, there was actually a counter narrative by Robert Hill, another researcher. He did the same kind of analyses. And when he looked at the data, he had a very different frame into the data, right? He said, look, what you're seeing is data of where you have black families that have a strong kitchen bond, that have a strong work orientation, that are adaptable, that have high achievement orientation and are have a strong religious spiritual orientation. So now you go from one analysis and interpretation that says that this group of people are, patholog are pathological basically. And another person was the same day say, no, this group is actually adaptable in their family roles. Again, because of the context that they live in and continue to live in, they have a strong work orientation because don't forget they were also enslaved. So they work for free and they continue to work for, for under, they're also underpaid even when they are free, right? And so when you look at it within a culturally grounded context, your interpretation of your data is very different. And so, but however, this counter narrative never really fully made its way to the policies that we have from the war on poverty and subsequent policies. And so as I challenge you all to have a very clear lens around anti-racism, I also challenge you to think about your interpretation of your data and the extent to which you're looking at it from either a very um, majority lens, AKA a white centered lens, or you look at it from a much more culturally grounded, nuanced lens that examines the assets. So for example, here's one of my works, right? I don't worry about trying to look at the, the data writ large, but basically my, I did this research around black boys because there was this whole conversation about, oh, black boys are terrible. They're not learning, they're oppositional. And that was a narrative that, and this is young uh, preschool black boys. And I was like, well, that's not true. I mean, I know many black boys and they are totally fine. 
And so I did this study using national data from the Department of Education, the early child, the early child longitudinal study birth cohort. And basically this data tells you that over 80% of black boys are doing well. And in many instances, over 10% of them are gifted and talented on the traditional metrics, right? And this is in the early years when they're three, four and five and six, right? When they go from preschool to kindergarten. And so it's how do you create sort of a counter narrative when all you hear from about a particular group is that they're terrible, they're not great, they're lazy, they're not brilliant, they're not unintelligent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's how do you begin to sort of look at from a more asset-based framing? Um, and sometimes the comparative research always says, hey, black and brown people, you're not that great compared to white people, right? And so we have to be careful that we don't continue that same narrative, especially out of context, right? Here's another example. Right, this again, I'm, I'm a sort of a child development sort of researcher. And so we have sort of a narrative that says that, you know, uh, black families in particular are intrusive, meaning that black families, when they engage with their child are harsher, quote unquote, more controlling. They don't give children autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and, that, and so that narrative continues to sort of, and that, that actually has implications for the kind of parenting programs we have or the kind of early child programs we have. Because if you're saying that most black parents are harsh, they're intrusive, they're controlling, that means that their kids are also not going to be ready for school and not going to be independent. That sets up uh, you know, black families up for some potential failure, right? Because you're saying that they're not good enough. That's what that means in essence. But when you look at it from a, a much more culturally grounded um, lens, you begin to unpack the idea of, first of all, whose lens are we using? That's one. The second is, are we saying that is intrusive a bad thing, right? Because you call it intrusive in your world, in a black majority world, it's actually the way you survive because you want to make sure that your children are safe, right? That if you that 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 when you're going out into the world, I want you to obey authority. I want you to be aware of everything. And so I have to kind of control a little bit of what you're going to do and say because society does not give you room to make mistakes, right? If, we, if you know about police shootings, if you know about the, the harsh treatment that black children in particular receive, you will understand that in some ways that parenting is, is a way to, to make sure that children survive. And so when you understand it in context, you may not see it as intrusive. You may see it as this is adaptive parenting because you're adapting to the culture and the context and the time frame that is happening. And that's something that's really different than saying, oh, black parents are intrusive, as opposed to saying black parents are adaptive, right? Because you have to prepare your child for both a majority world, but also your world, right? Because you live in a world that doesn't actually appreciate black bodies, black skin, black mind, right? And so it's something that we have to begin to be conscious about. And so as you all kind of go out in your work, in your world, I want to sort of leave you sort of with this idea, especially when I look at all of the speakers and the work you all do, I would actually encourage you to, to look at the, the, the sort of the work out of public health around the social determinants of health. And I sort of borrowed it heavily and in my world called the social determinants of early learning, right? So no matter what your outcomes are, right? Whether you're talking about, you know, those with disabilities or talking about sort of neighborhoods or talking about sort of food deserts, whatever the disparities or inequities are, is that if you put it within the lens of public health, which is all that we do, all really public health scientists in reality, right? From my point of view, right? When you put it in that lens, you look at it from this public health sort of angle, you'll see that when you look at it from sort of this, what are the contexts? that's driving everything? And what are the policies that inherent that create inequities or create opportunities, right? At the individual level, at the family level, at the community level, right? So when you look at it from much more of this macro level, then instead of blaming sort of quote unquote the victim, instead of blaming children and blaming families is when you look at policies about what policies are guiding um, a grocery store and opening? What policies are guiding, you know, IDEA around disabilities? What policies are guiding health uh, uh, health professionals about how do they treat women um, during sort of uh, the, during the sort of the prenatal period, right? So when you look at some of these policies and also the culture and the historical legacies of certain things, then you would not be surprised about the outcomes. And so that means that hopefully that your research is taking into account some of these sort of policy level things that create certain contexts, that create certain opportunities and or inequities. And so I, I really implore you all to think about 
the root cause analyses of your work because I think that when you kind of when you dig deeper into the root causes, it won't be like it won't be blaming the victim and trying to just do intervention on individuals or individual families, but you're going to start to do interventions really on the system, um, and, and and systems including policies, policy makers um, on a larger level to to because in the end of it, we want population level effects. And so I would, I would actually implore you to, to think deeply about that. Um, and because children, families, communities really function well when there's multiple systems and multiple sectors, this also helps you think about who am I missing? What sector is not part of my work or part of my lens? Who should I be bringing into the fold to make sure that we're fully capturing the potential solutions to the problem or to the inequities? Because inequities have been there for a long time. And just now that we're seeing it with certain you know, eyes, et cetera. So I want you to sort of consider both asset and strengths and also, you know, thinking about it from a minoritized and low wealth communities, right? So think about, are you using a deficit lens or using a more of an asset-based culturally grounded lens, right? And so, right, are you thinking about just needs or you also think about the strengths that come from it, right? People ask, well, how can you talk about needs and strengths at the same time? I think that's what we should be doing, right? For example, if you're talking about black families, you're talking about, well, yes, they're likely to live in poverty, have low wealth, all those things. But you can also say, you know what, but even in the midst of that context of low opportunities, of racism, they bring a level of resistance. They bring a level of flexibility. They bring a level of connectedness and kinship, right? So you can actually talk about those things things together because then policymakers can look at those things much more in a holistic way and create much more asset-based frame and policies. And similarly, practitioners and professionals, we only have one lens, right? The danger of a single story, right? Um, that, that we know from Adichie, the, the danger is that when you create one narrative, that means that a group of people and communities only have one way to come out of it. As opposed to if you create a much more holistic lens to it, there's multiple avenues that you can work, I can work, professionals can work, policymakers can work, because we see a group in a much more holistic and asset base. So I encourage you all both to think about the public health sort of framing in terms of historical and policy, but also really grounding your work in a much more asset based and culturally grounded way. I think that that would be really important. Um, if we're trying to really, uh, 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 I think, uh, heal people and ensure that whatever you're trying to do actually have population level effects at this point in time. So in my last few minutes, I want to kind of leave you with sort of like the who, how, and why, right? Like, why do you, like, why do you want to do anti-racist research and lens? And I would say because you have to, right? We, some of our outcomes, I'm an early child researcher and I, you know, from, you know, prenatal all the way to age eight. And the data hasn't really changed, at least the traditional data has not really changed. And so that means that we have to do things a little differently. We see COVID-19 and a disproportionate impact on, on communities of color. Um, and so we have to do things a little differently and we have to push ourselves to understand that we have been living this sort of uh, bubble of, oh, it's all about poverty and there's nothing to see here, it's about race. I would say, yes, it's not about race. It's about racism. And so I think as you, as you continue your work, think about the intersectionality of race and neighborhood, race and disability, race and food deserts, race and healthcare. So I, I think when you really connect race with anything else, you will see sort of the pernicious nature that we have been living under. You know, so as you think about how, who, and how, why, I want you to think about this sort of framework of richer, right? Because it's not just about the work itself, it's about how you do the work and who you do the work with, right? If you're still doing the same kind of research with the same group of people, and you're like, oh my goodness, my work hasn't really changed that much, it's because it's insanity. We have to do things a little differently. So I'm gonna give you this to sort of help to motivate us and motivate you to do more and to be a little different and a little open in your work. One is I want you to go deeper and re-educate, right? I think that now since you know the, the murder of George Floyd, I'm glad to know that more people are kind of like, oh my God, I didn't know, that's fine. But that means that you can't just say, I didn't know. You have to now say, what can I know more about the country, about the US in particular, but also global, right? Because the issue of racism is more, it's a global phenomenon. It's, it's really about colonization. And so to really re-educate you ourselves about the history, right? To unlearn things that you should not have learned about sort of black people, other indigenous populations, and also relearn really real information. Um, I want you to think about integrating your work, right? Think about the desegregation order by schools. They desegregated, but they never actually integrated, right? You move bodies, like black people have to move to schools with white majority uh, peers, but they never fully integrated. And so I want you to think about how do you integrate your work 
to be much more, um, I think, cross racial. And I did see some of that with the presenters. So I wanted you to go deeper, right? How, how, are you bringing in indigenous uh, uh, communities to your work? Are you having a cross racial team uh, membership at the leadership level? So think deeply about how do you disaggregate both your work, the theories you use, the framing you use, all that kind of stuff. And critique everything, right? Don't just assume, oh, well, this is what this research said. I want you to go deeper and critique everything, not just about the research, but also about yourself. And then also have humility in your privilege, right? Because we are academics and researchers, there's a level of privilege we have. And because we are privileged as researchers or scholars, we often don't understand that we have a weapon that could actually be used against people, particularly those without power. And then I want us to focus on erasing racism at all levels, right? Whether systematic, institutional, interpersonal. So really think about how do you, how can you be part of erasing racism? And then finally, as you kind of do your work, I, I encourage you to use some of the frame and at least look into some of the frame I suggest, sorry, um, around public health. Sorry, that was my son going a little crazy there. Um, I want you to sort of think about how do you re-envision some of your work to not just be traditional in itself. Think about your measures. Think about how you include the community in your work. How are you interpreting your work, right? So as you think about, and what theories are you using, right? Are they the same traditional theories or probably mostly all white men, right? How do you sort of expand your framing, your theories, your research design, your methodology and your interpretation to be much more acid-based? And then finally, I leave you with this, right? I want you to remember to, to, to sort of understand that research has power and it must be used well. And I really encourage you to do anti-racist research and you have to sort of live the research framework. And then finally, oh, sorry. And then finally, please stop. And finally, we are on a journey. So I want you to continue to read, engage, lean in because I do think doing nothing is really condoning racism. So I encourage you to do more and hopefully engage with other scholars and other uh, community members around you. And finally, I want to sort of emphasize this note, right? That speaking like this doesn't mean that I'm anti-white. It doesn't mean that, I, it just means I'm anti-exploitation, anti-degradation, anti-oppression. And I take that from, from Malcolm X, right? Because I'm, I'm asking you to, to do, dig deeper and to really sort of use an anti-racist lens and use an intersectionality lens from Kim Crenshaw, that it doesn't mean that I say everything white is horrible, but I do say that we have to think about the oppression of the system and research is inherently has been layered with racism. And so we have to be careful about how we sort of interpret and everything about the research design. So with that, I say thank you for allowing me to be in your space and look forward to conversations following this. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Phil. Energized. So appreciate your talk. Uh, do we have any initial questions for Dr. Iruka before we move into our roundtable discussion? I just want to like make sure we have some time for questions. That was a really great talk. I have like so many notes. Um, I had a question. Oh, it looks like we have one. I will hold mine off. Okay. You always got questions. I love that. I love that, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question. <laughs> I'm like a moderator. Um, I think these might be. I think the one from John Thompson is new. Okay, John Thompson, um, wait, okay. So um, yeah, I forgot what I was gonna say, yeah. Oh yeah, so my question was really about like, okay, I love that you say we have to be explicit. We can't like sort of code it internally to make people comfortable and say neighborhood or a school system and like, implicate the system. So like, could you give some examples of like um, being explicit about, about that and what explicit interventions end up looking like? I love that. So I would, so I would say this is really, I think, I mean, I think you have to understand and we all have to sort of agree that the U.S. was really built on racism, right? It was, it was the, the point was all about capitalism and it was really bit, built on racism and sort of that issue of power. And so if we agree with that notion, that means that everything that we do should be laced with that. So simply, even for some of our studies, is 
when you describe your sample, describe your sample, describe the racial makeup of your sample, describe the wealth, describe the neighborhood, like be very, like for in early childhood, I used to describe one of our national things that Diane actually mentioned. Oh, there were 123, you know, poor children. Well, no, they were poor black children because that actually makes a difference in the 60s that the fact that your sample was mostly poor black children meant that that was who you were able to get. And it's a power dynamic when it's mostly white researchers who got poor black children, right? There's a whole history in that to know that it wasn't just the white researchers that got there, but somebody black was a gatekeeper who opened the door for the black children to, to be in your study. So to me, making explicit means like say it, but it's not just making the racial part explicit, but it's also making it explicit that the racial differences you see is not actually an inherent problem with the with the people, particularly with, with the people of color. Is that you make it explicit that the disparities is actually a racism issue. And so that's why I actually feel like it's really important that we make that very clear, right? Because when you make it clear, then whatever the conclusions are like, okay, it's not about the children. It's not about the family. It's not about sort of this pathology of a particular community. It's about that the ism, the racism is the reason why we have the disparities, right? And then that means that your policy drivers are gonna be driven because you're trying to eradicate or mitigate the, the impact of the racism. So to me, if we're not very clear about who is your group, why are you studying them? And then all these things, then we just kind of just kind of gloss over the fact that they're black or brown or whatever and say, well, they just happen to be that. No, they happen to be that for a reason. And your outcomes is gonna drive your interpretation. It's gonna drive any other action behind that. And so, so I feel like, in the, and people have to sort of, I think be nuanced about when you mention race, is mention it with a context, Aries, mention it with a context and mention it with an understanding about the implications for practice and policy. And really, I think pushing on the system of inherent inequities and inherent systematic racism. And that's really what I would say to that. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because it seems like, okay, often when, I mean, just coming from like planning and often like they'll do a plan and it always has the same kind of demographic data, same sort of contextual data, but that idea of, um, I guess, like these different pillars of white supremacy, like slavery and um, prison industrial complex and that sort of persistence. Um, and then... The other is like maybe around genocide of indigenous people and land and the need for indigenous people to keep disappearing. So sort of like add that piece to the context too, right? Is kind of what I hear you saying. Don't just like put the data and say this race, this is what they look like. We're examining them from these indicators, but like kind of add more historical context around this notion of uh, racist or structural racism. So I appreciate that. Um, are there any other questions from the panel or participants? Anybody want to pop their hand up? Because if not, and, yeah. and no, I'll just I'll just quickly I just quickly you know I think for me I'm trying to push us as scholars to not take the easy way out, right? That we that that to me we have to sort of not be. I mean, and I'm part of this. Like trust me, I'm not like this is what I've been doing forever but that we kind of should not take the easy road out, right? Like we just describe and move on is that we have to sort of challenge and question whatever findings we have and make sure that we're not sort of injuring particularly communities that have been historically injured and traumatized. And I think that's what I'm going at is that we have to not be lazy. Lazy is not helping us. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and move into the um, panel or the round table panel portion of this. So if our panelists, if you will go ahead and turn on your, your video, that would be great. Yeah, so in terms of kind of like this common thread, I really love that we ended on this idea of assets. And, you know, I, I heard this sort of thread come through in everyone's work. And like some of the, um, women of color epistemologies and methodologies are definitely around like what happens if we turn away from a damage centered narrative about a community and we begin to embrace a desire based framework uh, or a futurisms or futurity based framework in our work. And I'm just kind of curious, like in your own research projects, 
how do you conceive of abundance and assets um, around the communities that you're focused on? And anybody that would like to answer that, how you conceive of abundance. Yeah, Diane, you look like you're ready to. Yeah, I was gonna say, this is Diane Horm from the first project um, with the Early Childhood Education Institute and the Urban Design Center. And we talked about um, focusing on a strengths-based approach rather than relying on um, just examination of risk. And um, Liz, I'm hoping you are um, prepared to talk a little bit about how we are enacting that in terms of some of the variables we're trying to extract from the data sets to examine. Sure, so like Diane mentioned, we are uh, recognizing the importance of the risk factors of the neighborhood. So things like the lack of grocery stores or the poverty level in that particular census tract and neighborhood. But we really wanted to come at it from a strengths-based perspective as well. Um, sort of like the graph that Ioma presented of the different profiles of children. We're planning on looking at different profiles of children who are doing really well in school or different profiles of neighborhoods that um, have a lot of strengths within them. And that can mean anything from the number of libraries, the number of museums in that census tract, to the number of grocery stores, the number of physicians and occupational therapists, to try to understand um, for which kids do particular things matter. Um, and we are also looking within different races. So for the Black, African-American, non-Hispanic children are certain strengths of the neighborhood more impactful on their outcomes, on their social emotional skills than our white Hispanic children. Um, so really trying to look at the differences and the nuances within each group, but recognizing what aspects of their neighborhood are really helping them thrive with the idea that if we can help figure out what is most impactful and helping them thrive, perhaps that's something that we can promote and put more money into and make sure that their teachers and their uh, leaders in the community know that um, not only does that help anecdotally, but that's helping in the data. Thank you. So uh, I have a quick question uh, from we got to note that the screen is black for some folks. Um, are, is it black? Is the screen black for other folks, the audience? And if you can like raise your hand. Yeah, it looks like. Um, okay. It doesn't look like it's black for Shaniqua, she responded. So I think it might just be an issue on that person's screen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, would anybody else like to respond to that or respond to the Team One's project about how you sort of work with assets, abundance, strengths on your projects and thinking about community? Um, I, I can go. Um, thank you, Aparna. Right, um, so uh, my answer to this is actually, um, to disc, uh, um, to introduce a bit of um, framing from intersectional disability studies into the uh, critical disability studies, which urges us to think about um, uh, vulnerabilities as the norm in human populations, and also urges us not to think of disability um, or try to frame force disability into narratives necessarily that focus on their strengths while um, you know, ignoring their vulnerabilities because that can some very often be driven by ableist desires for able-bodiedness or for us to erase disability. So um, as much as I uh, you know, value the idea of you know, this, you know, coming from a perspective where you center uh, strengths and assets. I, I also have to walk a very fine line when we, talk about, when we talk about disability because we do not want to erase the realities of disability. Um, and um, the other um, um, comment I, I was also thinking about um, is that, um, you know, 
um, much of biomedical and eugenesis projects have been about um, about building strength in populations, right? You know, for, for, you know, erasing disabilities, and especially, um, you know, so for uh, when we, one of the things we were trying to do with this project is to talk uh, use um, these objects and stories to. Um, get people thinking about how disability is not a tragedy. It's not a, um, it, 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 it is not the, um, so disabled people are either framed as tragic or heroic. There is no in between. So our project uh, by focusing on the everyday experience, corporeal and social experience of disability asks people to think beyond that and to, to use these technologies and stories to think about the ways in which disabled people across the state have, um, have lived their lives, um, I mean, of, often against the odds. And, and this is especially true for, um, you know, already minoritized populations where dis disability takes on other inflections. Um, so I'm not um, entirely sure that the, um, um, yeah, I, I, I think the, um, exhibit when we put, put it up will um, capture more of that than um, our, um, our presentation has today. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate the, the critique of even the frame of it being ableist. And I'm wondering if it could be reframed in terms of desire-based, what might be like a desire-based framework look like? For disabled folks and like do you have any sort of notions around that a desired present or a desired future the, uh, for, for much of the disabled community a desired future is one where disability is accepted as the norm uh, where we are not constantly striving for no, uh, uh, normal bodies and minds where we're not constantly seeking to erase disability um, and disabled minds through um, you know um, even before birth, um, all the way through the end of uh, end of our lives, where um, space is designed to be accessible to dis disabled people, everyday spaces are designed to be accessible for um, disabled people. Where um, um, you know, but um, fundamentally, disability studies also acknowledges that. Um, you know, you cannot have disability justice without racial justice. We, especially in this, in, in the, in the, in this past summer, we have um, one of the things that the disability community has been um, um, discussing exhaustively is the other ways in which um, you know historical factors have um, um, have produced the conditions uh, where um, black communities and people of color have. Uh, you know, um, have been, have become extraordinarily vulnerable to certain outcomes. And, you know, I, I, I think the, um, some of the things that we've been doing um, I, uh, that I do outside of this um, uh, to kind of connect these different fields um, is to historicize uh, this, um, and, you know, the relationship between race and disability. Um, talking about peace, people like Isaac Woodard Jr., for instance, a World War II veteran who was um, beaten and blinded by South Carolina police, um, you know, um, and discussing the um, the echoes of history and how we need to think about um, police violence and uh, you know the higher mortality and infection rates amongst um, communities of color and uh, the black community in particular um, as part of a historical um, trajectory um, and I think um, you know disability studies has a lot to offer critical race studies um, but I'm not entirely sure the conversations are always happening um, because, um, uh, in, you know, in explicit ways in public discourse, um, you know, in when we talk about inequity, I think disability is sometimes an afterthought, and that's that's uh, that's kind of uh, yeah. Um, so yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, I appreciate I'm that. Sure I answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. Uh, anyone else want to answer that question in terms of um, abundance, assets, desire base, any of sort of those frames about their project versus pathologizing community or damage based narratives? Sure, I can chime in, Laura. Um, Thank you, Andrea. Project, thanks. Also, I got some text from my co my co people, um, but I do think that one of the things about our project is that we do want our community to know that their sort of opinions are really important, and also that sort of the way that they engage with the environment, at least in terms of grocery stores and the design of it, that that might help shape the next thing that comes. And so we really feel like it's an opportunity for them to really get a chance to, to have a say. And maybe that hasn't always been the case. And I think in terms of framing it as you just did um, as a sort of desire-based approach is also really important because it is true that one of the things we're curious about is sort of what does our community, what did they want? Did they, you know, what, what do they want moving forward and how do they, um, go about expressing those needs. And we definitely think of, I mean, the East Side as we have a lot of assets, right? We would definitely count Restore OKC as an asset right now. They're doing a lot of work to push forward on this issue. We definitely count Council Member Nice as an asset. She's a strong advocate for the community and has really brought a lot in the last couple of years during her term. And so I think, um, you know, I, I like the idea of the asset model, but I really think that this notion of sort of thinking about listening and asking ourselves, what does the community want? So that desire based or that, um, you know, what's their vision for their future, sort of that positionality sounds really uh, great. And that's something that I think we are trying to do in our project. Thank you, I appreciate that. So um, the other thing that I have so many notes here, um, the idea, okay, so uh, Dr. Iruka talked about sort of being uh, reflexive about our privilege and definitely this notion of privilege yields more privilege. And I think of um, the work of Andrea Smith and she talks about these three pillars of white supremacy. And then I sort of threw in another pillar, but she talks about slavery, capitalism and prison industrial complex. And you can sort of trace the, some of these pillars through in terms of a past, present, and future. And um, so Dr. Iruka was really like sort of challenging us to think about our ethical obligations. Another pillar is around genocide, colonialism, and dispossession of land. Another pillar is around Orientalism and war. So like the fear of the other and xenophobia and like the policies that we see right now of basically trying to push immigrants out or targeting immigrants or targeting anybody that is not white. So those sort of pillars. And then sort of like this fourth pillar that I threw in there is around heteropatriarchy and how um, it's really bound up of what what a family should look like and what gender roles should look like and what gender should be. Um, yeah, so in thinking about that then, and as we think about our work, how can we identify some of these factors as Iruka challenge us to in our work? Um, how do they manifest? What do they look like? What, what do we have to disrupt to ensure that it doesn't continue in the future? So with that, like, what do you conceive of your ethical obligations in your research projects, especially around racism? So um, I'm going to throw out a quote here from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who defines racism as racism specifically is a state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differenti differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So, so many of what I heard, so much of what I heard today was really bound up in premature death and like us really, like how do we understand like these historical contexts that create our present moment that could possibly map uh, a continued future? Like, what do you see as your ethical obligations in your research work? Anybody would like to step forward or not step forward, I'll say lean. 
I can hop in on for our team. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, so, you know, I was reflecting a bit on Yama's very good point um, that some of our team's discussion about race and the role of race in neighborhood and neighborhood characteristics experienced by children didn't show up in our presentation, um, but it's certainly something we've been wrestling with. And, um, you know, I think most of you are more familiar with Oklahoma City than with Tulsa, but Tulsa is um, similarly very segregated. Um, there, you know, it's, it's not just a coincidence that most of the black folks in town happen to live in poor neighborhoods. You know, these are things like Ioma mentioned um, that were legislated in, you know, decades ago. Um, and so it's important for us to recognize um, how those socio-demographic characteristics, how your race in particular, um, directs you to a less advantaged neighborhood and then plays out, you know, in these, in these cascading ways that we hypothesize that it might impact not only children's self-regulation, but other developmental um, milestones that will, of course, forecast risk or well-being for many years to come. Um, but I think I was also just really reflecting on this idea of asset mapping and trying to cling to describing assets and opportunities and resources available to children, to families, to all individuals in a community. And I think that this is a place where white supremacy is really sneaky and it shows up in every, you know, in so many ways. So like our team, um, we talked a lot about what does it mean by neighborhood? How do you define neighborhood? How do you map this out? You know, and the census tract is not really the best metric in many ways of how people live because you cross to the other side of the census tract to go to the grocery store. Like that isn't, you know, but it is, it's the best model that we have. It's imperfect. Um, but the census data that are collected, well, guess who defines who go, what questions go on that census form? Well, the folks in power who, as we have seen, portrayed very vividly in current context, um, is largely driven by folks who wish to retain their power. Um, and so that means that things that a community, if we go and do this more embedded work with the community, um, I, things that the community might identify as their own strengths or that we could identify from, you know, a more qualitative approach to assessing strengths of the community. We're not going to find things on the census that says, tell me how strong your network is, you know, how many people do you have that you can call if your car breaks down, or how embedded is your religious group with your life and how much support do you derive from that? You know, I mean, it's these, um, more quantitative indicators of things that uh, are gonna be aligned to monetary gain for the most part. Um, so I think that makes it extra hard for us, but like Yoma said um, in her commentary, uh, we have to continue to wrestle with that, I think. Like it doesn't mean that the work isn't worth doing, but we have to acknowledge the limitations and really try to continue to push the envelope. Um, and I think that much of this work is hearkening out for a lot of um, mixed methods work so that we can partner um, folks like ourselves who really bring more of a quantitative lens can partner with people, um, you know, like the work that Andrea is describing that is really getting in there and talking to people and hearing their stories and figuring out ways to represent that more accurately in this back and forth conversation can really enrich the research and enrich the impact that, you know, none of us are doing this just to write pretty journal articles, I don't think. I think we're all doing this to have an impact. And so um, together we can make our work be more authentic and its representation of the community and then so then have, um, be more likely to have a true impact. Thank you, I appreciate that. I especially appreciate you pointing to census data and kind of these, um, demarcated communities don't always operate or demarcated boundaries don't always operate to tell us what community looks like. And yeah, I, I appreciate you guys talking about Tulsa too, because I grew up um, right next to there in Sepulpa. So I was always back and forth. And in um, some of my own scholarship, I talk about emergence geographies because again, I'm a planner. And again, 
like my ethical obligation is to community, but it's sort of like, because we were dispossessed of land, a lot of us live in rural communities and we don't necessarily show up on censuses because maybe the numbers are small. So when I start thinking of Sepulpa Tulsa, I start thinking of the way that these different geographies show up that of importance. So like the council oak tree that's uh, kind of like near downtown, that's like an emergence geography, like um, a metaphysical geography. It's a concrete geography. So like what are the different geographies and how folks show up? And like we have, I know folks from Tulsa come to the stomp grounds and like we have a pipeline of kids that are learning to dance and sing continually. It's continually turning over. So for my ceremonial grounds, I feel like I don't worry about it because we have a constant pipeline of kids. But yeah, the idea of like on the cultural side, how does community show up? Um, yeah. Would anybody else like to answer that question around like sort of what you feel like your ethical obligations are in your research, especially in terms of kind of those pillars that I talked about, slavery, slavery capitalism, prison industrial complex, genocide, colonialism, dispossession, orientalism, war, xenophobia, and uh, heteropatriarchy, family, and gender. Do you feel like any of those sort of um, aspects or dimensions show up in your work? And I'm just really curious to hear about um, what you feel like that strong pull is in terms of ethical obligations. Yeah, Alparna, thank you. Um, so um, traces of all of these narratives come up in um, history of disability in general. Uh, for example, um, you know, the production of disability, the mass production of disability um, in, in, in soldiers, um, in U.S. soldiers who go and fight and come back with, you know, broken bodies and minds. And disability is a very interesting way to, interesting and useful way for us to critique the, um, critique U.S. imperialism. Um, because of the production of the, the large scale production of disability and the way in which the um, state deals with that disability. The very fact that it took until the 1980s for them to even acknowledge PTSD as a diagnosis, um, you know, which they did primarily because they didn't want to um, uh, provide pensions for, um, um, you know, um, soldiers with that diagnosis. Um, so, um, uh, it, if this project goes ahead, one of the things that I do want to do is to, um, um, you know, uh, is to collect oral histories of uh, veterans and um, disabled veterans in the state of Oklahoma. Um, but I, I, I also think that one of the, you know, the pillars that captures elements of all of this is eugenics. Um, um, for, and for any disability history must seriously engage with um, um, with um, uh, eugenics and indeed Oklahoma is a site of um, um, you know experiments with eugenics but also is uh, Skinner versus Oklahoma is one of the landmark cases in the history of eugenics as a Supreme Court case um, that um, went all the way to the Supreme Court because the state wanted to sterilize um, 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 Skinner, who was a um, small time thief, essentially, um, and event the Supreme Court, um, um, you know, found against the state of Oklahoma. But um, we also know that, um, uh, you know, there's been systemic sterilization of Native uh, women in the state of Oklahoma, even after the um, um, even after the end of the war, when uh, the Second World War, when people typically um, tend to think that eugenics ended, but that's not true for um, for many communities. The project of eugenics, um, which used disability to um, systematically isolate, segregate, institutionalize, um, and uh, sterilize um, many women, um, was built um, um, continued in the years after the Second World War. Um, the, um, 
Uh, one of the things that I wish we had the time for, and I wish that um, um, you know I was an immunocompromised so that I could actually do this research, was to work with um, um, you know native communities, and um, um, you know um, I know that the um, the um, one of the things that bothers me about the work that I'm doing with uh, with this project is that it's still built around Western epistemology of the body. And I know that um, many um, non, um, non-Western um, um, understandings of the body understand disability differently. One of the things that we will be building into the project, for instance, is a history of um, uh, Plains Indian Sign Language and its use in um, in the state of Oklahoma, and the way in which um, you know um, deaf natives were actually able to communicate with um, hearing natives because this was a common language, and the ways in which um, 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 the um, Indian schools disrupted the learning of Plains Indian Sign Language as a um, as a shared language between um, between tribes. Um, this is true of indigenous communities across the world. Um, in Australia, you have the same disruption happening for um, Aboriginal Australians. It's happening with First Nations um, communities in. Um, who who also have their own um, sign language uh, systems of sign in, um, in in various parts of Canada as well um, and in um, South Asia too. Um, so uh, um, that's one way that I, you know I, I'm we're trying to address colonization and um, you know the pillar that you mentioned um, the. Um, I think um, the one thing that we haven't been able to do with our project is to center how um, uh, how slavery has produced disability. And um, I'm not entirely sure how to do this. I know that there are scholars who've worked on this. D. Boster, for instance, has talked about how there are complicated relationships between slavery and disability and how um, enslaved, um, um, enslaved uh, people actually uh, use disability um, to exert some agency over their everyday lives. Um, 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 and how um, um, how the conditions of enslavement also produce disability um, uh, on a large scale in um, in, in enslaved populations, um, and I, I don't think that ha- that has come out in the project as much as we would like. Um, Part of it is a function of the archive, and here you have to go into questions of method, right? The, um, um, you know, the, the problem is that um, the archive has certain limitations. The very stories that we, we want to tell, uh, they, you don't find them in the historical archive because these, um, these voices, these bodies were not deemed necessary to be recorded. So there is that. Um, um, yeah, that's uh, all I have to say. Can hear. Thank you. I appreciate you bringing so much insight into your work. Um, we have some questions here that I'm going to put out. Um, so this one's from Janet Ward, doc, Dr. Dr. Aikona Aruka's keynote presentation today brings together the key threads that run throughout each of today's projects led by the OU research teams. Are there ways that the research teams might like to continue threading these projects together? In other words, are there potential collaborative initiatives and or grant writing opportunities that could bring your respective teams closer together? And I'd love to hear from Talia and Zubair. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, there could be some potential opportunities uh, to collaborate together on this. Uh, I'm not sure how, but still I think needs some sort of uh, discussions. uh, Maybe after this talk, uh, we can have some sort of discussions together. Yep, uh, this is this is these are very interesting topics, uh, especially on 
how uh, from my perspective on um, uh, from AI and machine learning, uh, ethics in AI and uh, fairness in AI uh, is so important, especially when it is biases towards uh, racial and ethnic groups, how we can make it more accurate and robust uh, to identify, uh, you know, the group at risks uh, accurately. Uh, so this is some, this needs some sort of uh, techniques to deal with it. Um, and uh, this is actually something that I'm right now working on. Yeah. And thank you, thank you, Dr. Harjo and Dr. Razagi. This is Zubair in El Paso, which is building on that. Since we're using existing data sets, I think uh, this discussion is going to prompt us to go back and look and see if there are, um, you know, something what we can do with existing data. Like, was mom uh, is mom living in a neighborhood uh, where her neighbor neighbors look like her, or is she a person of color living in a uh, a census track or predominantly white neighborhoods. So again, day after day, microaggression or racism and maternal outcomes, pregnancy outcomes. Well, we're going to look into that and maybe also uh, besides neighborhood composition, racial composition, cortisol levels. So like um, Dr. Razagi is looking at other data sets that might be richer uh, to predict preeclampsia. And also we're going to now, I think, thanks to your uh, excellent suggestions, we're going to look into you know, markers of, um, uh, you know, a positive and negative. And so, um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, if I don't mind me just kind of hopping in to ping off of that. Um, one thing that we talk about quite a bit is um, racial match or ethnicity match between teacher and child. And I think that that's an important question for the um, physician or other healthcare provider and patient as well especially to the extent that we know that implicit bias is showing up in medicine and um, this whole notion or it's a reality, this very sad, grim reality of the um, false negatives showing up um, where the risk, the, the symptoms are just not recognized because they might present differently um, for women of color, but all of the textbooks and all of the cl clinical examples given in the places where folks might do their training tend to be based on the white majority. Um, so I wonder if some of your data sets might also have information on the, the race of the care provider and if that might provide some additional insight as well. Thank you. In terms of, oh, did it, was somebody gonna say something? Talia, is that oh, you? Okay. Sorry, I just want to ask Sherry's uh, uh, question. Uh, thanks for asking me this interesting question. Uh, we have uh, the information about uh, the race and ethnicity of mother and baby, but we don't have information about the uh, race, race of providers, unfortunately. Uh, it uh, comes from the state of Oklahoma and Texas, but uh, we don't have information from these data sets uh, that what, uh, what are the uh, ethnicity or race of the providers are. Thank you. Yeah, I, well, we're at six, but I would love to hear, um, well, I know like in terms of collaboration and that sort of thing, I could definitely see um, like the work that you're doing, Andrea, it really has me, and I've been thinking about like how a Dollar General store is popping up all over rural Oklahoma and sort of what that means for, um, like indigenous communities, just poor communities in general, and what it means in terms of food desert too. And then in thinking about um, Aparna's work as well, like I, it's funny that that question came in when I was sending a note to Aparna that I wanted to stay in touch because the idea of disability, like I really wasn't thinking about it, but when I turn and look and I see like, so many of my relatives and folks in my community that have that are disabled and like how to kind of grapple with that and think that through in terms of community planning as well but did you all have any thoughts as well in terms of um, collaborative initiatives or grant writing opportunities that maybe you see out of this sort of engagement or building on what the seeds that you already have I 
feel like I've talked a lot, but since there's a vacuum, I'll fill it. Um, so, but I do think that the work that Talia is doing, um, especially if you were, ever, if that group or in, maybe in partnership with the Health Sciences Center was able to move to primary data collection, um, I think that that could be a natural area of um, collaboration where not only are we looking at um, prenatally for the mom and the baby as well, but then moving into that fourth trimester for the mom and the baby um, leading into the earliest phases of development um, and how, you know, I think that there's um, a lot to be said about utilizing all the, the wealth of data that are collected about folks as they show up to our healthcare providers um, and how we can leverage that and um, make Know, make good use of that to get insight into a, a broader set of the community that we might not otherwise, you know, be able to interact with. Thank you. Any last thoughts? Any aha moments? Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge and the knowledge of your communities. Um, that sort of closes us out for today. And we have uh, one more talk tomorrow. And um, that will start, I think, at the same time. But uh, these, will be rec these recordings will be posted by uh, the vice president's or the research office, the vice president's office for research. Sorry, I just got here. Anyway, um, thank you all so much. And thank you so much, Dr. Iruka. I'm just so energized hearing your talk. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing all of your smiling faces someday soon <laughs> in real life. So take care and have a great evening. Thank you.